It's my pleasure to be here today. And as I look around the room, I can't help thinking that, you know, many years from today, when we're no longer worrying about these, someone is going to ask me, well, what did you do during the pandemic? <laughs> and I'm going to be able to say, well, I remodeled the basement. I should say we, my husband's over there. We remodeled the basement and put in a wine cellar. I didn't do any traveling. I retired from being a flight attendant. And I wrote a book. Wow. And you know, that's really quite a lot to get done in that period of time with everything else going on. I never knew that I wanted to write a book until one day I did. Because the, pu uh, the publisher of the company that published the book uh, had passed through Seattle and we had met for coffee and this was long before COVID. And it wasn't anything I was really interested in. And then we chatted again when I couldn't travel, and I was stuck at home, and there was not much going on. And I said, yes. And it's not a typical guidebook. This is really more of an unusual, wacky, crazy kind of things, almost a love letter to Seattle and the surrounding areas. You know, the things from our sketchy history that we've come to embrace and accept, even if we don't uh, give our approval to it. The crazy kind of things that we do things that are normal here that other people would think was strange. So this is not only a local guidebook and a book for locals, but it's also sort of a love letter to Seattle. Um, and I've lived in Washington State all my life, this greater Seattle area for uh, 45 years, uh, plus years. And I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey through some of the places that I discovered. And I think the, the biggest thing that my husband and I said as we were driving around and doing some of this research was, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that. And it makes you realize that even someone who's lived all their lives, there's something new and something fun to learn. So just to get a little bit of an idea of here, if I've got fellow Seattleites here or recent transplants, how many people have lived in Seattle five years or less? Ten years or less? Twenty years or less? And how many people here have lived in the Seattle area of more than 20 years? Wow. All right. So some of these places I know you're going to heard of, have heard of, but you may not know some of the backstory. I thought I'd take a couple of um, places nearby. Some places that maybe, you know, if you're feeling up for a walk or a bike or, um, you know, even a little drive. Some places that you might be uh, interested in visiting that are relatively close to home, don't require a big commitment. Are there any bikers? Well, here's a fun fact I found out, is that in 19, excuse me, 2019, the Washington State Driver's Manual added a requirement for the Dutch reach. Now, that doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not a biker. But if I was taking my driver's test, it was something I want, want to know. And what it is, is is a policy that was enacted, and not surprisingly, Dutch reach came from the Netherlands, of a process of how you exit the car, either as a passenger or as the driver. So to minimize any potential risk of a door injury, like opening a door into a biker. And how that works is as you're sitting in your car, instead of reaching over and then just opening your door, and if there's a biker there, you can have a problem, you reach across with the opposite hand, and in doing so, turn your body to look back. And that forces you to look to see if there is a, a biker there, and then you continue with that. Uh, with opening the door. Oh. Well, I got my driver's license a long time ago and that wasn't anything that was on the test or that I even had to learn to be aware of. But it's amazing that I didn't know about this until I started doing some biking research and came across, across it. I knew that it was something in Europe, but it has been adopted here in, the, uh, here in the States. So, something to keep in mind. Over on Aurora Avenue um, is Aurora. She's an elephant. She weighs about 9,500 pounds. 
and she's been there for a long time. If you're a long time resident, you may remember that she was on top of the floral shop that was over uh, on Aurora Avenue. Eventually, the owners of Aurora Rents, which is a rental company, uh, bought the, the property and put in their business, and they didn't you know, really plan on keeping Aurora. But she had become such an iconic, kitschy, fun little destination. They got phone calls from people from around the world asking about Aurora. And so they decided that they would undertake both the time and expense of refurbishing her. She was actually built somewhere around the late, to, uh, late 20s, early 30s. And it was just a, a backyard project by, by the artist to kind of keep his employees you know, busy, and there wasn't a lot of work, and you know, between the depression and emerging from the depression, there just wasn't a lot going on. So they gathered up chicken wire and pipes and all sorts of things from the backyards, and just sort of built this elephant. And if you've been by there, she's still standing up there today. And even though she's listed as available for rental, the terms are pretty outrageous in that it's, it's a $10,000 rental charge and you have to replace her with some uh, similarly situated statuary of an animal subject to approval. So they had really fun, uh, had a really fun time uh, making Aurora the, the um, party elephant, the elephant in the room, if you will. Weighing even more than Aurora is Wedgwood Rock. Now, I didn't know about Wedgwood Rock, um, but it is just what it sounds like. It is a rock in Wedgwood. Uh, nothing very um, exciting about that. Its estimated weight is, a one, is approximately 1.5 million pounds. It's uh, 80 feet in diameter, the circumference, and it's about 20 feet above ground, but it's expected that there is some underground um, properties to that as well. It actually dates back to the Ice Age, and it's called a, a glacial erratic rock, and there's only about five instances of that in the Puget Sound area, and this happens to be one. Um, originally, it was just on property that, were, that was, you know, originally forest and then eventually a uh, farmland. And that's just what it was. It was a rock. No one thought anything about it. But it soon became, I mean, given its size, it, it, people would meet up at the rock. And it sort of became a, a hangout. Uh, and there were efforts to turn it into a park unsuccessfully. It still remains on private property, uh, but it has been, uh, you can tell by the the trees behind it, it's, it's not in the middle of the property, it's really on the edge of the intersection. And that's the intersection of 28th Avenue Northeast and Northeast 72nd Street. Um, it's still there, it's still a meeting place, um, it still represents some um, pretty historic times in terms of the evolution from the Ice Age. Um, but don't go climbing on it, because apparently some time ago the city council imposed a $100 fine for anyone who might be climbing on it. I'm guessing that's because the, there were some nuisance issues. When I checked with the city of Seattle, they were unable to tell me the last time that anyone is issued a citation or fine for climbing on the rock. A little farther over by the lake are these things coming out of the, the ground. What they are, are fins from decon decommissioned nuclear submarines. There's 22 of them, and they're all spaced along in Madison Park along Lake Washington, which you can see there in the background. They range from four to 12 feet tall. They weigh about 10,000 pounds a piece. I mean, these, these truly were nuclear subs that were uh, in operation during World War II. They've been arranged on the uh, on their property to look like they are the fins of an orca, and it, you can see how it kind of looks like like one there. But when you see them all together, um, it, it really does look like a pod. I don't know. We know that the J pod and the K pod are are out in the Puget Sound area, so I don't know what what we could call this one. And certainly they're not in on Lake Washington. 
but again, this is a piece of art and a piece of military history that I didn't know about until I started researching, and I thought that was that was kind of fun. How uh, you you know you wonder where do where do submarines go to die? Well, apparently they they become art. Also over at Magnuson Park, and, and I'm going to say, I, I still mistakenly refer to this as Sandpoint, because when I grew up, it was Sandpoint Naval Air Station. There was a guard gate, you showed your ID to get through. So uh, if I make that slip up, um, it's because I've lived here long enough that that's, that's how I remember it. But it is officially Magnuson Park named after um, our former senator. The At the entrance is this statue, which you know, it looks relatively unassuming, you know, sort of some wings. We're not really sure sure what it was. But it does memorialize a pretty significant uh, occurrence, and especially from Seattle with such a strong aviation history. This was the location that the first flight to circumnavigate the world started. Started in Seattle at what was then uh, San Point Naval Air Station. It was an army mission. The Air Force didn't uh, come along for a few more decades. And four planes left. They took a very unusual route. It's not how we go around the world today. They went up to, uh, went up to Alaska and then over, uh, you know, across to China and Japan and, and all the way around. It took 175 days and it both started and ended here which is a pretty significant bit of aviation history that I had never heard about. And you know, after 33 years for the airlines and being an aviation, a bit of an aviation geek, I was really surprised to learn that this was the, uh, this was the place that started it off. And of course, then, then many, uh, many flights followed after that. And just recently, since actually it was after uh, we were out there for the doing research for the book, they've opened a display out there. So if it's if aviation history is something that is of interest, um, that, you know, I'm looking forward to going back and seeing what kind of artifacts and everything they had on display. And the first flight left there April 7, 1924. So we're coming up on on a hundred year anniversary. So I expect that there will be some additional displays and exhibits and perhaps commemoration activities. Going back to some of Seattle's earlier days, I know when I was in school, we spent a lot of time talking about the Seattle uh, founding, the founding fathers, the Denny's, the Gesslers, the Borens, the, we know the streets named after them, and talking a lot about the gold rush. I can, I can remember going to see the movie North to Alaska, um, and, you know, go north to Alaska, the rush is on. It's a very significant part of our history. In fact, much of the evolution of Seattle and the city it became would have been completely different were it not for the gold rush. It really did change how, you know, people came to the city, what they did when they were here, uh, and, and the businesses that were involved. This is a typical outfitter's kit. Um, this is from a display at the Klondike Museum, which is part of our national park system down in Pioneer Square. And it basically is what two people would need if they were going to be in the Klondike for, for approximately two years. So two people, two years. And you know, they didn't have stores there. So you had to pack up all of your your supplies, your non-perishable foods, your clothing, your tools, your basic first aid, um, soaps, everything that you would need to get by for uh, about two years. Now, at the time that the, the rush was on, this kit, this outfit, cost about $250 to $500, depending on, you know, you could splurge a little here, you could reduce a little here. Any ideas what the equivalent value of that would be today? Would it surprise you to know that the value of that today would be between eight and sixteen thousand dollars? So that tells you it wasn't the decision to go north was not without a lot of financial cost. And there was a lot more thought that went into it than as we sometimes see in the movies, like, oh, you know, I'm not doing anything, let's head north. 
interesting to note, for Seattle, 100,000 people headed north to Alaska. Of those 100,000, 30,000 actually made it to, to the Klondike fields. So it was a very, very small percentage. Of those that made it to the Klondike field, only 4,000 found any gold. Oh dear. That's any. That's not to say they a lot of gold. That's not to say they got rich. That's not to say anything. That is any amount of gold. But you know who made the big money in, in the gold rush? It was the people, the merchants that sold those outfitting kits. And those are the people like the Nordstroms, um, the Nordhoff family, which went on to found our local Bon Marche. And those were the people who really made the money during the goldfish, or excuse me, during the gold rush. Goldfish, gold rush. And I don't know about you, but that was never anything anyone talked to me about when I took Washington State history. How many of you went to the Seattle World's Fair? Almost everybody here. I, I, you know, I remember it. I, I was a, I was a kid. It was such a treat. It was a big deal for my parents to take me to the World's Fair, and the the theme of of Century Twenty One. It seems sort of funny now, but living in the space age. So right now we really are living in the space age. Back in, in the 60s, we were talking about it. But who would have guessed that in the summer of 1962, some of the things that were forecasted would actually come to pass? This view that you see of Seattle, and you're, you're going to see it everywhere. You're going to see it on art, and on posters, and on the front of books, on green screens, on television shows. That's actually taken from, from Cary Park. It's one of the spots to get the truly iconic view, the photograph, of the city. You can get, of course, the, the Space Needle from the World's Fair, as well as the rest of the skyline. It's great during the day, beautiful view on a, on a sunny day, even a cold fall day. It's beautiful up there. It's very popular with uh, for bridal photographs, for engagement photos, uh, you know, tour buses from out of town. It's a, it's a very uh, a great spot, and that's where you get those iconic views of the Space Needle, and sometimes you'll, you'll actually get it with the arches from the Science Center uh, in the foreground as well. Who wrote the bubble later when you were at this, the, yeah? It was actually at the Washington State Coliseum, and it, it really just went uh, to uh, one floor. So it went from, the, uh, from the, the entryway to the world of tomorrow floor. And that was it. It would hold 100 people. It's about 19 feet uh, across. And I can remember, I mean, it's one floor. We can walk up. You know, as I recall, they had the slanted ramps and elevators. We could walk up, but everybody wanted to ride the bubble later. After the World's Fair ended, which would have been October of 1964, this moved to, excuse me, 62, this moved to what we knew as the center house, which is where the food court was. They had, you know, many of the festivals there. Um, you know, during Halloween, it was dressed up like a pumpkin. During the Christmas holiday season, uh, winter season, it was dressed up as a snowflake. And then one day, remodeling had to happen, and it became a matter of deciding what to do with the bubble later. It was uh, dismantled and donated to Children's Hospital. And they put in storage, and nothing happened to it. They didn't know what to do with it. I mean. What do you do with the bubble later? Um, a newspaper man from the Seattle Post Intelligencer was doing a 50 year retrospective of the World's Fair and you know, tracked it down. It was sort of like the question people ask is, well, you know, whatever happened to the bubble later? And he tracked it down and found it disassembled in a warehouse with children at Children's Hospital, and nobody knew what to do with it. So he bought it for a thousand dollars. Sounds like a great bargain, and it cost it cost a lot more to get it actually moved, installed, and back up looking like it does. Today it's in his front yard, 
it serves as a greenhouse. And this was taken during the, the fall. You can see a few things in there. He's also had concerts in there, a variety of kind of events, but he basically just rescued it and now it's in his front yard. So we now know what happened to the bubble later. What neighborhood is it in? I'm sorry? What neighborhood is it in? Um, it's in Redondo. Just a couple of blocks up from the water in Redondo. And it is a private residence. I mean, um, I want to show some respect to private property, but uh, this was this was taken by the uh, from the street. But I understand there are times, especially when some of the World's Fair, uh, you know, retrospectives come up or some of the the commemorative days, that he probably gets a lot more people knocking at his door. The World's Fair also predicted that we'd have video phones. I get video on my phone, and perhaps some of you do as well. But this is nothing like what the video phone was at Century 21. It was a huge behemoth of a piece of equipment. About three feet. Lots of cabinetry surrounding it. Looks almost like one of the the computers from when we we first had them and they came out and they were this huge thing that sat, uh, sat on your desk. You can actually see that artifact at the Connections Museum, a museum that I didn't know existed um, and I found fascinating because it is dedicated to telephony. So it's got everything about communications from uh, telephones to movie cameras uh, and all of that kind of thing. It was really fun to go through it. Now this isn't a, it's really more of a curated collection than a formalized museum. It's very casual, there is, there's just stuff all over. This is a, an old PBX from uh, probably, it was before the World's Fair, so it's more like the, uh, the late 50s. It has some information on the time lady. Do you, uh, let me like now. I want to know what time it is, and I look at my phone, and it says it's 3.59. But I used to have to get on the phone, the, the rotary phone, and um, I don't know, I, uh, I don't even remember what we called for, for time. Um, and there was a lady who said, that at the tone, the time is, whatever it is, and then there was a chime. And well, that was a real person, um, and her, let's see, her name was Jane Barbie. And there's just a wonderful display about who she was, how that whole process um, evolved, and the people who, who, how many people would have to be staffed to make sure that this all worked. And it was really a, a fascinating uh, story about how, it, you know, we need to know what time it was. And we don't need, to, we still do, but we still don't approach it in the same way. There's also a film camera from, I believe it's King TV there, that was actually used to record the opening of the World's Fair. And if you've seen, uh, watch the news and you see a remote, you, you know that the camera is just not very big anymore. One, one person can kind of carry it around and uh, remote filming of, of news events is pretty common. But you'll look at how big this equipment was. And it makes you realize that we have so much more power and capability in just a fraction of the space that it, it would take. This museum is down in, in Georgetown. It's in a, the second floor and part of the third floor of um, a, a basically a telephone substation kind of thing. Uh, I, they've been closed off, you know, during COVID. It was by appointment only. But if you, um, if you're, if you're sort of like into this kind of stuff, it really was fascinating. Probably an hour, hour and a half, with plenty of time to get through and see it. It's run by uh, volunteers and who just have a passion for it, and they can tell you incredible stories of what uh, Seattle connectivity used to be and how that that fit into the larger piece. Um, and you'll also find some other uh, artifacts from the World's Fair there. <clears throat> it's hard to talk about Seattle without talking about sports, and sometimes those conversations are a little sadder than at other times. Um, let's see, did the Seahawks win last weekend? Yes. Okay, so happy days. <laughs> 
but we've all uh, we've all if you follow sports at all, we've been through those those good weekends and and bad weekends. But one thing that I didn't know until I started researching for this book, and now it's become fairly common knowledge because we've got a soccer team, or excuse me, a hockey team. But do you know who the first U.S. hockey team to win the Stanley Cup? It was the Seattle Metropolitans. <coughs> the Stanley Cup had always been a Canadian thing. It was their cup, it was a, a national award, uh, and that's just the way it was, it was just uh, where it was. And then the team up in Vancouver moved to Portland, and they were contenders, and they weren't having any part of being excluded from this championship. So they were the new Westminster Royals when they were in Canada, and then they became the Portland, uh, I think they were the Portland Rosebuds or something like that. And they wanted to be included in the, in the championship qualifications. And so, of course, that opened the door to all, all U.S. teams being included. In 1917, the Seattle Metropolitans were the first U.S. team uh, to win the Stanley Cup. They were also the first... Seattle team of any sport to win a major championship. Until I wrote this book, I had never heard of them. Which seems sort of odd the way we have almost a, a reverential respect for so many of our sports heroes today. We've got streets named for them, we have stadiums, we have all sorts of, of naming, but you'd be hard pressed to find anything up until recently uh, that talks about the Seattle Metropolitans. They played in an ice arena that is, is uh, down by, and again, I'll show that I'm a long-term resident here, where the Olympic Hotel is. It's now the, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, to me it was, will always be the Olympic Hotel. I think it's now the Fairmont Olympic, um, as this changed hands. But that's where they were located. And that, that property was owned by the University of Washington. And it's pretty proud in real estate. And so they eventually were going to uh, sell it, and as a result, you know, it meant they needed to relocate. And you know, they hung on for a couple more years. They actually did return to the Stanley Cup um, in 1920, a couple years later. That was a year, ironically, of the Spanish uh, influenza pandemic, and the the cup was called. So it was a tie with the Montreal Canadiens, two, two, and, and one tie. So they never did play to a finish, one of the few times that there was never a winner in the Stanley Cup. So they made two appearances, one winning, one, one tying, and after it was called. Uh, but you just didn't hear much about them. Five members have been inducted in the Hall of Fame, uh, uh, Hockey Hall of Fame up in Toronto. And the Kraken, we're hearing a little bit more about the Metropolitan now because the Kraken are playing. The little red, right here in their um, their cup, it also appears on their uniform, is a tribute to the Metropolitans, whose team colors were red. So it seems like um, they have so done some things. They've, there's actually been some commemorative things. So we're, we're hearing a little bit more about them than we did. Any Mariner fans? Baseball fans? Yeah. Um, baseball was a sport I grew up with. My dad was, a, was an umpire, and so I learned about baseball uh, and how to properly score a game from a very young age. If you've been to a Mariner game, I, I, you may be able to see it on television, or they might cut away for commercial. But at this, in the seventh inning, after the seventh inning stretch, they move into a rocking version of Louie Louie. And everyone's up dancing and singing along. But Louie Louie goes back a long way. I can remember the Kingsmen playing at, one, at my homecoming dance, um, and they were the band, Portland band, who gave Louie Louie a sort of a second life. Originally it was a ballad uh, about a Jamaican sailor who was returning from the sea um, to see his long lost love. And you know, it was you know, slow and moving and, and all of that didn't really take off. Nothing really happened to it. 
The Kingsmen in Portland decided that they would record it, and this was in the 60s, and, and make a record out of it. So they did. But you know, they didn't have a lot of money. They were sort of a home, home band, and you know, they kind of cobbled together 50 bucks and decided they could press a record. You know, the mics weren't really good, there was sort of noise in the background, things were kind of scratchy, equipment was, you know, a little bit subpar, but they got that record out and, and were very excited to say. Um, it was a B-side record, it wasn't, uh, I don't even remember what was on the, the front side, but it wasn't expected to be the big hit. But their version, you know, it, it was the rock and roll version, it was the, the get up and move version, and it took off. But as it took off, everyone started noticing all of that <laughs> that noise that was from the lousy mic, the background noise that what? I can't really understand that. I mean, I can I can remember it. I think there's websites devoted to um, lyrics that we think are right are right, but we're really <laughs> wrong about what the lyrics are. Well, this was was that kind of thing exacerbated. And so people said, well, if I can't under, uh, understand it, it must contain obscenities. And this was sort of an era where we wanted to find obscenities and things. And so letters were written and complaints filed, and the FBI actually undertook an investigation. And they played it forwards and backwards at you know high speed, at slow speed, and, and determined that no, there's really no obscenities here. It really is just a different version of a ballard, which leads me to wonder, have there not been those allegations of obscenities? Had there not, the FBI not been involved, had there not been all that press, would Louie Louie have been a hit? And would we be listening to it in the seventh inning stretch at the Mariners game? <coughs> <coughs> I remember growing up watching the Hydro Races, and it's been called various things. I always know it as a Seafair Cup in a, the era of sponsorships. It's got another uh, commercial name attached to it. But every August, um, it, it, that was just something we did. You know, we we would have a, a barbecue, we'd have friends over, we watched the Hydro Races. When my husband and I were first married, that's what we did. We had everybody over. We watched the the various heats. Um, it, it was just a Seattle thing. Sometimes you could go down to the pits, down at San Sarah's Pits, down in Lake Washington. Um, it was a long, you know, a long weekend of trials and everything that Blue Angels would do their practices. Uh, I, I think that's the last time I was down there was, was uh, a couple days before the actual race to watch the, the Blue Angels fly overhead. I mean, it was just one of the Seattle events. It was part of, of probably the preeminent besides the Grand Parade. It was the preeminent seafair event when I was growing up. It's also the longest continuing running hydroplane race, unlimited hydroplane race, on the racing schedule. So it's been around since 1951. Um, I grew up in the era of Miss Bardall and Ole Bardall. You know, the slow motion, uh, the Miss Budweiser, um, Ms. Old Boy Roberto. I mean, these were the, the Seattle names that I grew up with. I can remember cheering for Bill Muncy. Um, and just the whole experience of Hydros was, was not just about sport, but was also about community. A new place I discovered is down in Kent, which is a hydroplane and race boat museum that has many this one here is the Miss Budweiser, has many of the classic hydros um, th uh, that I grew up watching. It's, it's kind of a, uh, again, it's, it's sort of, it's a curated collection, but it's not, it, it, you get close to it, you can touch things. You can't climb in the hydros, um, but you, you can get close to see how small that cockpit of that hydroplane is. They have unlimiteds and they have uh, the unlimited. They've got trophies, they've got clocks, they've got all sorts of memorabilia. You know, they honestly deal with the fact that it's a very dangerous sport. I mean, they show the, uh, you know, they have the, 
the, the crash that killed Bill Muncy. They have the uh, they have some great displays of local writer uh, local writers uh, drivers Chip Hanauer, who, uh, who's from the Seattle area, and Dave Billwalk, who's from Gig Harbor. So the the curator, when we were going through, I mean, it, because we grew up here, it's like every time we turned around, it was like. Oh, well, what about when? And it was reliving some of those moments in sport. And he said that that's really a lot about what it is. It's not just about seeing things. It's about li reliving those experiences, which I think is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to have in a museum. So that's down in Kent. Uh, they are back open and uh, probably limited hours and with the, the usual requirements for safety protocols. If you've watched any of the paranormal shows, uh, I can't even keep track of how many, for a while that they were rife on the Travel Channel. Um, haunting is big business. Paranormal is really, really big business. A lot of them have filmed here in Seattle uh, at various properties. Some have you know, said there are some activities, some have said no, there's simply no activity. So I did take some time to find a few spots in Seattle that have both historic and potential paranormal activity. I'll let you decide which you want to believe. The first place is Merchant's Cafe down in Pioneer Square. And this goes back to uh, Gold Rush era during our founding fathers. Uh, very popular cafe back during that time. They did a lot of business with uh, miners coming through uh, on their way to the, the gold mines along with the, the people who came here to found our city, to build it up, to, to make it into the city that it is today. At the back of the building were walls with photographs, portraits of seamstresses. And men could come in and select a seamstress. And they really weren't seamstresses. These ladies didn't sew one whit. It was actually a prostitution. They rented a rooms upstairs by the hour and did quite a, 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 quite a big business uh, until that, uh, that either died out from a variety of causes, either didn't have the clientele or, or the local government was cracking down on that. Today, there are a couple of photos at the back of those seamstresses that still have been preserved and existed. And interestingly enough, the upstairs instead of being uh, a by-the-hour kind of room, have been turned into apartments. Now, it's believed that one of the seamstresses haunts the women's bathroom. <laughs> and there have been a variety of, of reports. Some of the paranormal investigation has substantiated it. And what's really interesting is, despite it's, you know, rather sketchy and colorful and, and probably, you know, kind of fun past, if we're to be honest, is that the cafe was designed by W.E. Boone, who is a direct descendant of Daniel Boone. So we have some, some good history there along with it. One of the popular ones is Kells, and that's been investigated by a number of the paranormal sighting kind of people. It's down in Post Alley by the, um, by the Pike Place Market. This photo was taken when it was closed up during COVID. So, it, um, in better times, those iron gates are opened. The, this, was at, this is in the Butterworth building. It is actually the location of Seattle's first mortuary. The, the bodies would come in on, on gurneys and, and tables and whatever they had available to use through these front doors. So these front doors that are to Kells were the front doors to the mortuary. They would then be be rolled back to the elevator, taken up to the third floor where various work was done, whether that was embalming or um, what the autopsies or whatever needed to be done, so that was on the third floor. The banquet room today is where coffins were kept, so when, when bodies were ready to uh, for services, the, they were put in coffins and they were stored in the banquet room. Now they have uh, they have some many ghosts there, or many paranormal entities. One of the um, one of the things that is reported is a smell of formaldehyde, or a small 
strong chemical smell, which is believed to be related to the fact that that would have been uh, chemicals that were used uh, for mortuary services. They also report sounds of broken glasses, whispering, banging noises that are coming from upstairs, again, where the, the facilities would have been, laid, uh, been located. There are apparently two regulars that hang out at Kells, spiritual, or from the spirit world. The first is a, a young girl with long red hair. The second is a man dressed in a white coat, uh, similar to what a doctor or perhaps a mortician might be wearing. There have been numerous reports, numerous investigations on that. Um, I've been there quite a few times and uh, haven't seen anything, so I would love to know I uh, would love to talk with someone who maybe has a little bit more um, direct access to the paranormal than I do. But of all the places that I read about and researched, this, if there's going to be paranormal activity, a former mortuary seems like the place where that would be. <clears throat> One of the more gruesome locations for, uh, for a haunting is the Georgetown Castle and uh, it was located in, in Georgetown. It dates back to 1902, and a gambler by the name of Peter Gessner built the castle for his wife, Lizzie. Classic Queen Anne style, you can see the turret, the gable, uh, very, very classic uh, styling. Well, Lizzie wasn't quite as enamored with the castle, uh, or with Peter, for that matter and soon took up with a local chicken farmer. And so she moved out and took up with the farmer before the castle was completed. You know, Peter continued with his gambling uh, hall down in the Pioneer Square area. It was eventually raided and he got forced out and decided to relocate his business to the castle. And so for quite a number of years it was uh, his, his gambling business. However, one day he was found dead in the castle. And although there was suspicious circumstances, it was determined that his cause of death was suicide by uh, a type of acid poisoning. Although there were always lingering suspicions, and depending on who you want to believe, sufficient information to track it back to Lizzie and the chicken farmer. who coincidentally, moved in as soon as Peter was out of the way. It said that while he may have died, he never really moved on. And he continued to stay there both when Lizzie uh, lived in there and then changed hands a number of times. It was, uh, you know, it was a brothel, it became a gentleman's club, it went through various incarnations. In the 70s, uh, Boeing used it as a boarding house, a respectable, boarding house, uh, and it's, it's said that there are often heard sounds of fighting and just sort of noises of some sort of altercations, and it's suspected that, that Peter may have had something to do with that. This was another uh, fun one to research, and this one is actually in Lakewood, down south of Tacoma. Um, technically not Seattle, but we don't want to totally shun our neighbors to the south. This is one of the few privately owned castles in the United States. It's located on uh, American Lake. It was owned by the Thorne family, who actually shipped bricks back from England uh, to, the, to Seattle, to the, to the port, to build this 27,000 square foot castle. It, um, it, the bricks all date back to a 15th century castle. The stained glass windows actually date back farther than that. It's believed they date back to the 1300s. So this is, you know, the Georgetown Castle was sort of a, of a nouveau kind of thing. This is, this is a real European castle. Uh, Thorne and his family lived there. At one time, there were 100 acres on the lake. There were, you know, beautiful rose gardens. There were manicured English gardens. There were forests. There was places to swim. And there, when they, uh, as they were getting older, they told their daughter Anita that they, the only child, they were going to be leaving the the castle to her, on the condition that it never be sold. 
that it remain in the family, that it be kept intact. Guess what she did? She sold it. Um, it wasn't too long after her parents passed away that she ignored their request and she sold it. And it is believed that her parents became so angry over this that they returned to the castle. Now the, the castle has changed hands a number of times. And uh, it's been, uh, the reason it was originally sold, no surprise here, subdivision, new properties, housing, um, you know, the basic growth that has happened and that we've seen in a lot of properties. However, they did keep 10 acres uh, surrounding the, the castle, and so it now has uh, waterfront access, as well as 10 acres surrounding it. So there is some preservation. But Chester, Father Thorne, um, has been uh, accused, if you will, of unscrewing light bulbs in what would have been his room. And uh, guests, it is now actually an inn and event center, along with a private residence. And guests have reported light bulbs being unscrewed in his room. Uh, Anna Thorne, Mom Thorne, has been cited sitting on a window seat reading in what would have been her formal sitting room. So they have been uh, reported. This has such an illustrious history and is such a beautiful property that Stephen King used it to film his miniseries, uh, Rose Red. It also was the venue for the filming of the Daniel Day Lewis film There Will Be Blood. I don't remember I don't remember seeing it in that, but but clearly this is just the kind of just the kind of place that can look um, attractive but yet with a kind of spooky, eerie kind of feel that's perfect for Stephen King. So what about regular housing? For those of us who don't want to take up with a with a paranormal spirit. This is a spite house. It's located in Montlake. It is a, it is a private home. And a spite house is just kind of what it sounds like. A, a home, usually unusually shaped or something unusual about it, whether it's the shape or the location, that's built to spite someone. Um, that could be, you want to irritate your neighbor. It could be an ugly divorce. It just could be something that you're doing and you don't really care about anything else. At one time you could do that. Now there are actually regulations that prohibit it. But this spite house is 860 square feet and it was built in 1925. It's sort of a wedge shape. So this is the, the back door entrance. It is 55 inches wide. Think about what we have for social distancing and six feet. Yeah, do the math, okay. You know, kind of think about how, ah, I might have to turn sideways to get it. I certainly couldn't get in the door carrying anything. At its widest point, it is 15 feet, and that's in the master bedroom. And inside it, there are two bedrooms, two living rooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a basement. There's actually a mudroom off of the kitchen, and that's what you're seeing just through this door goes into the mudroom, and then beyond that is the kitchen. It is, there are two theories about how this house came to exist, and it is just a crazy shaped house when you're looking at it. Um, one is that it was an ugly divorce, and the wife was given a very small piece of property out of, out of spite uh, because she was entitled to something. And this is what the division of property, and remember this would have been back in the 20s, so division of property was, was not quite what we see today. And so, so instead of being spited, she decided to build this to spite. The other theory is just it was a neighborhood problem, and I don't like that story quite as well. I think this one has far more, far more interest. This was last on the market in 2016, and it sold for slightly over $500,000. So it may be small, it may be narrow, but location, location, location. This was another form of spite, I guess. This is the Maysfield House. It's in Ballard. If you've been through Ballard and seen where Ballard Blocks is, this is the big development with um, shopping and residence and all sorts of uh, business stuff 
and this is kind of sandwiched in between. It belonged to Edith Maysfield, and she had numerous offers from the builders of Ballard Block to buy her house. And she said no. She was an older woman. She had lived in this house for, for virtually all of her life, and she just didn't want to relocate. And so she said no. And of course, negotiations being what they are, the, the offer kept getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and eventually grew to about a million dollars. And she still said no. Wasn't out of spite, she wasn't against development, but this was her home, she was getting on in, in age, and she just wanted to spend the rest of her days there. So the building went on without her. The project continued. Uh, they were out there every day doing, you know, what happens at building developments and as things go. She actually became a friend with the project superintendent, uh, Barry Martin. In fact, many days they would have lunch together. And, and became very good friends. It wasn't a, a spiteful thing. There were no hard feelings. She did was just her house, and she wasn't going to leave it. They became so close that actually in the last few years of her life, uh, Barry Martin became her primary caregiver and basically took care of her until, uh, until she passed away. Now since then, the property has changed. Oh, and I should add that she left the house to him in her will. Her state provided for him and, and for all the things that he had done to her. So there was a, it was a genuine friendship. It's changed hands a number of times. It's still this is the condition that it's still in. I would have thought that somebody would have snapped it up, probably for a higher price than it, than the million that it was offered for. Um, but it's fallen into disrepair. It's boarded up. Um, some graffiti. There's there's been um, you know barbed wire put up so that no one can get in. It, the last time it actually ever saw any real life was when the Disney film Up came out. Um, a lot of people think this was the basis for the movie Up about someone who wouldn't leave their home. Um, it's not. The timeline doesn't, doesn't match up with when this happened versus when the movie was released and everything. But they did do a lot of promotional work out here, so it was um, sort of spruced up a little bit. There were lots of balloons and everything. And one of the local tattoo parlors uh, artists designed a tattoo of the Maysfield house, and underneath it it says the word steadfast. So sort of a sort of to honor someone who um, you know truly wasn't looking for money. She wasn't holding out for money. It wasn't spiteful. She just wanted to she just wanted to stay in her house. <clears throat> this is the Stone Cottage in West Seattle, and it goes uh, goes way back as well. Um, Eva Falk and her mother had this home built. And when I say had this home built, I mean by local artisans. This, this uh, can't remember how far this goes back, but it goes, it goes back, uh, back to the early days of Seattle. They would go out to the Point Alki Lighthouse, the beach out there, and there would carry rocks in their wheelbarrow or in a, um, a bag or that they would pack on foot back to their location on Elkai. And I mean, it took a lot of time, it took over 15,000 stones to create this house. And this is right on Elkai. And I mean, I had to have driven by it, you know, dozens and dozens of times. I never paid any attention to it. Because of course, as a passenger, I'm looking to my right at the gorgeous view of water and the skyline of Seattle, not to my left, with rather sorry looking stone house because it did fall into disrepair. Um, uh, as progress would have it, the property was sold to developers and they were going to destroy the stone house. The uh, historical, uh, Southwest Seattle Historical Society got together, did some fundraising as part of trying to save, you can see, save the stone cottage. Um, and they were successful. And the developers, you know, did not I mean, I mean, they were happy to have the stone cottage saved. Um, they just didn't want it there on their property. These are multi-million dollar views and um, a pretty dilapidated, although beautiful in its own way, stone house. So they donated a bunch of money to help get uh, the seeding started for the fundraising. They raised enough money to to um, to save the house. You can see the scaffolding and the 
things that are being built and put into place. The, the, it was actually getting ready to be moved. I believe that probably has now happened by now. I'd have to go back and confirm that, but it was getting ready to happen at the time the photo was taken. They're moving it to just sort of a secure location where it's going to be kept until a final uh, real piece of real estate parcel can be found, and then they will move it to there. The idea is basically to restore it as to how it would have been in the early days in, C uh, in Seattle. The Duwamish tribe is also very uh, involved in helping to save the cottage. They believe that the souls of their ancestors are found in on the beach, in the sand, in the rocks, in the stone, and so they believe the souls of their, their ancestors are represented in this uh, property or in this building, and so they've been involved in helping fund it and, and helping to find a a spot for it. So you can't see this right now, but hopefully they will be able to find a parcel. And this is, you know, moving it was one thing, but now finding that parcel and getting it moved again is is a a very very expensive proposition. We've looked at all sorts of old housing. How about some new housing? The Smith Tower for many 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 years. It, it was the tallest building west of the Mississippi. Um, the Smith in uh, of Smith Tower is actually the Smith of, and we're going to date myself very good too, of Smith Corona typewriters. You remember? I don't know if you, I mean, that's how I learned in typing in, in uh, junior high school. Um, L.C. Smith. He didn't envision a big, tall building like this. He was just going to, you know, build this building, and then his son said, "Aha, Dad, wait." There's this building in Tacoma that's that's taller than this. Shouldn't you build it taller than them? Um, the building was the National Realty Building. We know it now as Key Bank Center, and so he built it to be um, the 38 stories to be taller than than the Tacoma building. A little competition between cities even back then. On opening day, 4,200 people rode the elevators, the brass elaborate elevators. And for many years, this was how they were known. They had um, elevator operators who welcomed you into the and took you up to wherever you were going. Beautiful, ornate brass elevators. The observation deck is on the 35th floor. And those elevator operators continued until 2017. And that's when uh, zone or not zoning uh, safety requirements meant they had to update all the elevator systems and that meant um, automation and so they do have one uh, elevator operator that remains but the others all uh, move, had to move on on the 35th floor is the wishing chair and I remember I remember this from, from growing up uh, there when I was a kid it came from Emperor, or excuse me, Empress Dowager Sichi uh, in 1908, and it was believed that any unmarried person who sat in that chair would be married within the year. Uh, Smith Tower at that time was a proper place for proms and, and fraternity uh, dances and stuff like that, and I can remember that being a, um, one of those, you know, those you know, rumors are one of those myths, fables that, that everyone would talk about at that time. At the top, uh, in the top of the pyramid is uh, an apartment. And this was, uh, the apartment part was added on uh, later. I mean, the pyramid was there, but it was turned into an apartment somewhere later. And it was uh, originally um, occupied by a family, a software family, and um, they did not tend to to renew their lease. So la the time the book went to press, the apartment was available. There were photos of it in the in the sale times, and the last known listing price was seventeen thousand dollars a month, and that was based on a long term minimum three year lease. So a little bit different than the Spite House and the um, and the Stone Cottage. Pretty uh, pretty sweeping views from up there. I'm sure. I've only, obviously, only a little bit to the observation deck below that. And so I love my city. I love living here. Haven't uh, haven't left for any meaningful period of time except to travel. 
I'm glad that I, I said yes when the publisher asked if I wanted to, uh, to write the book because I really did enjoy learning about my city and just talking about some of the things that we might not hear about any other way. Um, the book is available at all the places you can find books, bookstores online, um, Amazon, of course, my husband's over here, he, uh, we have a little small business, he can ring up some, some charges over there if you're interested. And I am happy to, what are we doing for time? Yeah, we're running a little bit long, but I am happy to answer any questions if you have any. Are there any comments? Anyone want to share any stories? Well, I saw some heads nodding at varying places, so I know something must have been going on. I remember clearly the first. Um, I don't know if this is on. Oh, I don't think it's on. Sorry. The first year that the Seafair, the hydroplanes raced. And Stan Sayers was the main, uh, he had his boat, the slow motion, and then he had the slow motion too. And I remember all the boats would go into the uh, pit there to be repaired, but Stan would take his over to his home in Hunts Point, and then he would have it looked over, and then he would come roaring under the bridge right when the time, I mean, it was, it was, it became a really, is he going to make it on time? Is he is it going to is he going to overshoot it? He did it perfectly every year, and um, it was just a it was exciting. It was an exciting time. Well, they named the pits after him, Stan Sarris. Yes, yeah, Stan Sarris. It was really fun to be a part to see that. And and Pat O'Day doing the the yeah. race calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on.